Keep your OTR trucking business rolling. Make TaxesForTruckers.com your partner to handle the money side. TaxesForTruckers.com can help you pay less taxes, keep your books, and track your finances to stay on the road towards your goals. Get started at TaxesForTruckers.com. That's taxes, the number four, truckers.com. This edition of Space Time is brought to you by Audible.com. Get a free audiobook download and a 30-day free trial at www.audibletrial.com forward slash space time. Over 180,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, Android, Kindle or your MP3 player. That's audibletrial.com forward slash space time for your free audiobook. This is Space Time Series 20 Episode 9 for broadcast on the 1st of February 2017. Space Time is brought to you in collaboration with Australian Sky and Telescope magazine, your window on the universe. You can download Space Time as a free twice-weekly podcast just about everywhere, including iTunes, Stitcher, Pocket Casts, Bytes.com, YouTube, SoundCloud, Audioboom, and from SpaceTimeWithStuartGary.com. The show is also broadcast coast-to-coast across the United States on Science360 Radio by the National Science Foundation in Washington, D.C., Coming up on Space Time, new evidence that the universe is being blown apart by dark energy, the secret of the supervolcano that almost killed off the human race, and a spectacular February sky watch, providing us with both a close encounter with a comet and also an annular solar eclipse and penumbral lunar eclipse. All that and more coming up on Space Time. Welcome to Space Time with Stuart Gary. The universe's rate of expansion is continuing to accelerate at an ever-increasing rate, according to new measurements. The findings have important consequences for the ultimate fate of the universe and how soon the universe ends. The study by the International Holy Cow Collaboration, by the way, Holy Cow stands for HO Lenses in Cosmo Grail's Wellspring, is reported by way of five papers on the pre-press physics website archive.org and in the monthly notices of the Royal Astronomical Society. The measurement, known as the Hubble constant, indicates that the universe is expanding at a rate of about 71.9 kilometres per second per megaparsec. A megaparsec is a million parsecs, or about 3.3 million light years, with a single light year being 10 trillion kilometres. So in other words, it's really fast. The Hubble constant is named after Edwin Hubble, the guy they also named the telescope after. Back in 1929, he discovered that all the distant galaxies he saw were moving away from us, regardless of which direction they were in. And those that were the furthest away were receding the fastest. What that meant was that the universe, rather than being a steady state, was actually expanding. The new figure for the Hubble constant is based on a measurement of the gravitational lensing of distant quasars and is accurate to about 3.8%. First predicted by Albert Einstein's general theory of relativity, gravitational lensing occurs when light from a distant background object, such as a galaxy, or in this case a quasar, is bent and magnified by the gravity of a massive foreground object, such as a large galaxy or galaxy cluster. Quasars are powerful jets of energy produced by feeding supermassive black holes. They shine out like lighthouse beacons, bright enough to be seen over halfway across the universe. This bending of light by the gravitational lensing effect of mass on the fabric of space-time causes an apparent increase in the brightness of the background object, in this case, quasars, allowing astronomers to measure them in greater detail, in the process providing the most accurate measurement of the Hubble constant ever obtained. However, the new measurements don't quite line up with earlier figures for the Hubble constant obtained by NASA in 2013. They showed an expansion rate of 70.4 kilometres per second per megaparsec, nor do they agree with the Wilkinson Microwave Anisotropy Probe, or WMAP, figures, which gave a slightly faster rate of about 71 kilometres per second per megaparsec. The new study's authors say the discrepancy could be hinting at new physics beyond the standard model of cosmology. The study's lead author, Sherry Suyu, from the Max Planck Institute for Astrophysics in Germany, together with colleagues from the Holy Cow Collaboration, used a range of ground and space-based telescopes, including both the Hubble and the Keck twins on Mauna Kea in Hawaii, in order to observe three galaxies and arrive at a totally independent measurement for the Hubble constant. 
Suyu says the Hubble constant's critical for modern astronomy because it helps confirm or refute whether science's understanding of the universe, composed of dark matter, dark energy and normal matter, is correct, or whether something fundamental is still missing from the picture. Dark energy is a mysterious force which makes up about three quarters of the universe's total mass energy budget. It's driving cosmic expansion. Dark matter is an equally mysterious and invisible substance which makes up about a quarter of the universe and exerts a gravitational pull on normal visible matter and light in the universe which we know only accounts for about 4% of the universe's total mass energy budget. The holy cow astronomers measured the Hubble constant by exploiting massive galaxies that were acting as gravitational lenses, each of which is bending light from an even more distant quasar, a cosmic object whose brightness varies randomly. In each case, the gravitational lens creates multiple images of the quasar. Because mass is distributed through these massive galaxies in an uneven fashion, some areas bend or slow down the light more than others. So the light from the quasar will arrive at slightly different times, depending on the route it takes through the lens. Just as drivers who set off from one city to another at the same time but travel different routes will arrive at different times. By analysing that delay, the study's authors were able to arrive at their own figure for the Hubble constant. The holy cow estimate for the Hubble constant is 71.9 plus or minus 2.7 kilometres per second per megaparsec. That's in close agreement with measurements by other astronomers based on observations of supernovae and of variable stars known as Cepheids. But these estimates are rather different from that obtained from the Planck Space Telescope, which measured radiation from the cosmic microwave background. The afterglow from the Big Bang, measured some 370,000 years after the Big Bang 13.8 billion years ago. Planck found the Hubble constant was only 67.8 plus or minus 0.9 kilometres per second per megaparsec. But the Planck measurement does rely on some assumptions, for example, that the universe is flat. On the other hand, the difference could be a statistical fluctuation, which will disappear as estimates get better. But then again, it could also be something far more exciting. After all, when scientists are still seeing something different, even as error bars shrink, that's got to raise the possibility of maybe some new physics beyond the standard model of cosmology. The Holy Cow team now plan to further reduce those error bars by undertaking the same measurements for up to 100 different gravitationally lensed quasars. Understanding the Hubble constant is important for knowing how strong dark energy is and whether that's changing in strength, which is vital for understanding the ultimate fate of the universe. You see, too little dark energy and gravity will take over, eventually stopping and reversing the expansion of the universe. That would ultimately result in the universe starting to contract, ending in a cataclysmic big crunch singularity destroying the cosmos. With just the right amount of dark energy, the expansion of the universe could coast to an eventual stop, resulting in a static steady state universe. However, if our current understanding of dark energy strength is correct, then the universe will continue expanding forever. Eventually, all the stars and other galaxies will disappear beyond the cosmic horizon, leaving the universe a cold, dark and empty place, in what astronomers are calling the Big Freeze. But if dark energy continues to increase in strength as the universe expands, then we face a far more horrific fate. Not only will the universe continue to expand on cosmic scales, but that expansion will also happen on smaller local scales as well. Eventually, even molecules and atoms will be torn apart at the subatomic level, in what astronomers call the Big Rip. And the stronger the dark energy force becomes, the sooner that Big Rip will occur. Dr Brad Tucker from the Australian National University's Mount Stromlo Observatory has been studying the mysteries of dark energy to try to better understand its cause and effect. It's all about precision. You know, we kind of know the answer roughly, but if you really want to know what the universe is doing, you need to know that number as precisely as possible because it is hinting at a funny universe and we want to make sure how funny of a universe we really have. So this is, um, what, physics beyond what we know now in cosmology? This is new physics? It could be a sign of new physics or the current physics we have being different. So it could be dark energy is a little bit different than what we think, or it could be there's something else in the universe that we haven't really understood or ventured into the knowledge of that 
could be providing extra acceleration or extra energy that we're just now seeing the evidence for. So what is dark energy to the best of our knowledge? So what we currently think is something called vacuum energy, and that is the energy of the vacuum of empty space. So as you grow more empty space, you grow more vacuum, which gives you more energy, which causes the universe to grow, growing more energy, and so on and so on. It's like a vacuum cleaner in reverse that keeps sucking and sucking more and more and more. And this is something that Einstein originally predicted to kind of work with relativity and work with gravity. And so it's a constant effect. But if there's something else we're missing, then maybe dark energy isn't constant and it is a new form of energy. Can you describe it as a sort of anti-gravity, the opposite of gravity? So yeah, dark energy could be really gravity working in reverse and then actually a, a property of empty space itself. So it could be the space in between galaxies acting in reverse to gravity, causing everything to grow faster and faster apart. If it is dark energy we're talking about here, what does that tell us about the impact dark energy is having on the ultimate fate of the universe? So this is a, one of the most practical questions we have is what's going to happen to us. And if dark energy is constant, this thing that Einstein predicted, we'll just keep growing and until we get something called the heat death of the universe or the big freeze where the universe just kind of tapers out. But if it grows too fast, if dark energy is too strong, it could actually rip apart the universe in a lot shorter of a time. We're still talking about more than after the sun has long destroyed the earth, so we don't really have to worry about it. But we're talking about tens to hundreds of billions of years instead of hundreds to trillions of years. You've been part of a team that's done its own work looking at dark energy. Tell me about your project. What did you find? So one of the things we did was trying to measure the Hubble's constant very nearby, so in the local universe as we call it, to kind of get a measurement of what's going on now. Now this is different to the techniques that Holy Cow use, but if the techniques are independent and we can come at the same answer, then we kind of know what we're doing. That's the essence of science. And we have seen that the speed of the universe of H0, the Hubble's constant, is different than what we've measured from the cosmic microwave background of that very first light we can see. And if these numbers are different, if the speeds are different, then there has to be something going on in the universe. There has to be something implying that dark energy might not be just anti-gravity. So, you know, the, the, the question then turns as to what is going on. Now, it always could be that you're wrong, and you have to think of that first, which is great of these measurements from Holy Cow. Completely independent, different group, different technique, and they're getting something very similar to what we're getting. So then you have to turn to is dark energy different? Well, all of our other measurements of dark energy tells us it's just kind of anti-gravity, uh, something like that. So then we have to think of, is there actually something else, something we've called dark radiation, which could be a new type of particle, a new thing in our universe? Now, that's a big big thing to, to propose. So measurements like holy cow put us on the right path to seeing, is this really the hypothesis that is correct? It wasn't all that long ago when the European Space Agency's Planck satellite came back with its own measurements looking at the Hubble constant. They were different again. That's right. It's kind of, we're getting an interesting thing that wherever we look in different parts of the universe, which is really measuring a different time of the universe gives us a different answer and that isn't usually a good thing in physics and where holy cow is important is it's far away so it's not nearby like our measurements have been but it's not as far away as the Planck satellite and what they've previously published and it's telling us that it's closer to what we think nowadays and very far away so maybe it really is something has changed dramatically in our universe because we know dark energy has changed its strength with time. Our universe hasn't actually always been accelerating. It decelerated for a while. So that tells us that our universe is changing and hopefully doesn't change again. Maybe we would actually understand it. But there is something not quite sinister, but there's something interesting going on. The deceleration that was caused because gravity was stronger back then, because things were closer together physically, the balloon hadn't expanded enough for gravity to lose its strength? That's right. In this epic battle between gravity and dark energy, the balloon was still close enough for gravity to be stronger, but it just grew too much and so your period of acceleration happened and that's what we are in today. But it also could be that maybe dark energy just changes with time and really just likes to confuse with us. I hope not. I hope it's just a more simple answer, but measurements like holy cow start to clarify what's going on there. Does the Casimir effect have anything to do with this, or is that just simply on such a small scale, it can't be included in dark energy calculations? So that's an interesting thing, and people have actually tried to calculate and worry about this, and so far the answer is no, we don't have to worry about it. But, you know, an interesting thing is when you calculate from fundamental quantum mechanics, from fundamental physics, when people like Sean Carroll or Lawrence Krauss calculate dark energy, they get an answer that's 10 to the 120 orders of magnitude off from what we measure. They get a huge, diff hugely different answer, something that not even astronomy can say is close. So 
we do then do have to think what is really going on because there's something we're missing here. There's something in this big picture that is just not making sense. And that's the real question, isn't it? Do we really know what the universe is made of or are there things we still don't understand even though we like to think we've got a reasonable handle on it? Right now when we look at the work being done, the Large Hadron Collider and other places like that, we know that the standard model of particle physics isn't telling us everything. That's right. You know, it's, it's, firstly, it's naive to think we understand the universe. Every 20 years and we think we understand the universe, someone discovers something new and wins a Nobel Prize. So, you know, maybe we're on that path to discovering that new fundamental thing because you know, we, we know we're incomplete. So the more measurements we have in different ways allows us to figure out, is it a measurement problem? Is it something we've missed? Or is it really something telling us something new about the universe? And we hope for this all to come together one day, but I don't think that day is today. I know that when general relativity took over from Newtonian gravity, everyone regarded that as being a revolution, but it really was just a focusing and an extension of that when you look at things on a finer scale. Is that sort of where we're going with the next big leap, what we're now calling new physics? Well, and that's what I think of. It's taking that next step. And, you know, it's interesting, is, as you said, it was relativity from Einstein was that next step. And it's only now that we've confirmed a lot of things, right? With the discovery of gravitational waves, we've mm. now discovered most of the things that Einstein predicted. And so gravitational waves actually offers us another way of probing the universe in a completely different way. So we hope that that next big step kind of, I like to think of it as rushing nesting dolls. You know, the Newton nesting doll fits in Einstein one, well, maybe Einstein's one fits in another show that we might just be able to be starting to understand. That's Dr. Brad Tucker from the Australian National University's Mount Stromlo Observatory. And this is Space Time with Stuart Gary. To planetary science now. And the largest volcanic eruption in human history, the Toba supervolcano in Indonesia, was apparently triggered by vast quantities of water-laden rock coming into contact with the volcano's massive magma reservoir. The volcano's secret was revealed by geochemical clues hidden deep inside volcanic quartz crystals. The Toba volcano eruption some 73,000 years ago pushed humanity closer to extinction than ever before. It was the largest known eruption on Earth in the last 25 million years. The Toba eruption plunged the planet into a volcanic winter, with average global temperatures dropping by about 5 degrees. The resulting famine is believed to have slashed the human population down to as little as a thousand breeding pairs. This population bottleneck had consequences which influenced the genetic inheritance of all humans today, and may have triggered Homo sapiens out of Africa migration. The Toba eruption blasted some 2,800 cubic kilometres of volcanic ash into the atmosphere. That ash eventually blanketed much of the planet, especially raining down heavily over wide areas of Indonesia and India. Scientists have long debated how these extraordinary volumes of magma were generated and what it was that made this magma erupt so explosively. Now a study in the journal Scientific Reports claims to have found intriguing clues hidden deep inside millimetre-sized crystals from volcanic ash and rock generated by the Toba eruption. Quartz crystals that grow in the magma register chemical and thermodynamical changes in the magmatic system prior to the eruption. It's sort of similar to how tree rings record climate variations. When the conditions in the magma change, the crystals respond producing distinct growth zones that record these changes. The problem is each tree ring analogue is only a few micrometres across, making them extremely challenging to analyse in detail. That was the challenge met by the study's lead author, Professor Valentin Troll from Uppsala University. Troll was able to painstakingly analyse quartz crystals from Toba, finding a distinct shift in the isotopic composition towards the outer rim of the crystals. It seems the crystal rims contain a relatively lower proportion of the heavy isotope oxygen-18 compared to the lighter oxygen-16 isotope. The low ratio of oxygen-18 to oxygen-16 contents in the crystal rims indicates something in the magmatic system changed drastically just before the big eruption. The explanation behind these chemical signatures is that the magma melted and assimilated a large volume of local rock, which itself is characterised by a relatively low ratio of oxygen-18 to oxygen-16. This type of rock often contains loads of water, which may have been released into the magma, producing heaps of steam and thereby increasing gas pressure inside the magma chamber. 
This rapidly increasing gas pressure eventually allowed the magma to rupture the overlying crust, sending thousands of cubic kilometres of magma high into the atmosphere. Luckily, these sorts of cataclysmic super eruptions happen very rarely. Still, geologists and volcanologists are keeping a very close eye on places like the Snake River Yellowstone hotspot, located under the 72 kilometre wide Yellowstone caldera in Wyoming. This hotspot has erupted regularly, with the most recent events taking place 2.1 million, 1.3 million and 630,000 years ago. Importantly, Yellowstone has the same volcanic explosivity index as Toba. Scientists use a scale known as Volcanic Explosivity Index, or VEI, to provide relative measurements of the explosiveness of different volcanic eruptions. Like the Richter scale used for determining the magnitude or strength of an earthquake, or the Enhanced Fujita scale for tornado intensity, the Volcanic Explosivity Index increases logarithmically with explosive power. The Toba eruption 73,000 years ago had a VEI of 8, and Yellowstone had the same. By comparison, the 1815 Tambora volcanic eruption, also in Indonesia, was probably the largest eruption in recent history, with a VEI of 7. More recently, Mount Pinatubo on the Philippine island of Luzon erupted in 1991, killing hundreds and providing people as far away as Sydney with spectacular purple sunsets. It was probably the largest eruption of the 20th century, with a VEI of 6. That's equivalent to 200 megatons of TNT, or about 13,000 times more powerful than the atomic bombs dropped on both Hiroshima and Nagasaki to help end World War II. Pinatuba was also about the same size as the famous 1883 eruption of Krakatoa in the Sunda Strait, between the Indonesian islands of Java and Sumatra. That eruption culminated in a series of massive explosions and tsunamis, and a vast pyroclastic flow of superheated magma and gas, which killed some 36,500 people, destroying most of the island and leaving a giant caldera. The Krakatoa eruption blast is believed to be the loudest noise ever heard by humans. So loud it was heard 4,800 kilometres away in central Australia. A new island, Anak Krakatau, or Child of Krakatoa, has now emerged from the 1883 caldera and is already undergoing increased volcanic activity. Most of our listeners will remember the spectacular 1980 Mount St. Helens eruption in Washington State. It blew away the entire side of a mountain in the largest known debris avalanche in recorded history. The eruption sent a column of gas and ash over 24 kilometres into the sky, melting glaciers and creating volcanic mudslides known as lahars, and producing a pyroclastic flow that flattened vegetation and buildings over an area of some 600 square kilometres. But as spectacular as Mount St Helens was, it's only rated a 4 on the VEI scale. I'm Stuart Gary. This is Space Time. OK, time to take a quick break from the show and talk about one of our sponsors. Yeah, there are many times when you can't hold a book, but you can listen to one, such as when you're commuting, when you're at the gym, jogging, or walking the dog. And that's when I listen to Audible. It's my audio bookstore. And you know, I love the idea of someone reading to me. And no one offers a greater selection than Audible. In fact, they've got something like 180,000 titles plus to choose from. Audible's great if, like me, you have an unquenchable thirst for knowledge. Audible means you can learn so much. And right now, Audible has a special deal for space-time listeners. Audible's offering a free audiobook download with a free 30-day trial to give you the opportunity to check out their service. And they've got so many great books to choose from. All the bestsellers, the classics, science fiction, science fact, history, biography, whatever, often from the people who actually wrote them. How about Born to Run by Bruce Springsteen, narrated by Bruce Springsteen? Or The Life of Keith Richards, narrated by Johnny Depp, Joe Hurley and Keith Richards himself. No matter what your taste, there are over 180,000 titles to choose from. To download your free audiobook today, go to audibletrial.com forward slash spacetime. That's audibletrial.com forward slash spacetime for your free audiobook. Or just click on the link at spacetimewithstuartgary.com. And now, back to our show. Time now to turn our eyes to the skies and check out the celestial sphere for February on Skywatch. As well as a close encounter with a comet, the February skies are also providing us with both an annular solar eclipse and a penumbral lunar eclipse. 
On February the 11th and 12th, people across Greenland, the far northeastern tip of Canada, as well as all of Europe, Africa, the Middle East, India, Central Asia and most of Russia and parts of Mongolia will be treated to a penumbral lunar eclipse as the full moon passes through Earth's outer shadow or penumbra. During the event, the moon will appear a little darker than usual, but it won't be as spectacular as the blood-red full moon visible during a total lunar eclipse. Also on February the 11th, the comet 45P will be at its closest orbital position in relation to the Earth, just 12.4 million kilometres away. Comet 45P is making its way back to the outer solar system following its close encounter with the Sun back in December 2016. It should be visible to the unaided eye shortly before dawn as a tiny fuzzy ball against the constellations Aquila and Hercules. On February 26, the Sun will undergo an annular eclipse, appearing as a ring of fire along a narrow band of the sky, starting in the southern Pacific Ocean, and then crossing Chile, Argentina and the southern Atlantic, before crossing the African coast at Angola and finally ending in the Congo. An annular solar eclipse occurs when the Moon is too far away from the Earth to completely cover the face of the Sun, resulting instead in a ring of light around the darkened lunar silhouette. And throughout most of February, sky watchers across the Southern Hemisphere may be lucky enough to catch sight of the occasional meteor associated with the Alpha and Beta Centaurids meteor showers. As their name suggests, they appear to radiate out from the direction of the constellation Centaurus as two separate streams. They rarely produce more than one or two meteors per hour. If you want to check them out, they'll be peaking on February the 8th. To best see them, you should look towards the east a few hours before dawn. Jonathan Nally, the editor of Australian Sky and Telescope magazine, joins us now for the rest of our tour of the February night skies. Now, I'll, I'll say from the, at the beginning that, as always, these notes are for stargazers in the southern hemisphere. For those in the north, the planet info will be much the same, but, but some of the constellations we're talking about uh, might not be visible or might be unfamiliar. The Milky Way at the moment, at the beginning of February, and the Milky Way is the glow of our galaxy, by the way. It's, it's the view of our galaxy from the inside, because we're inside our galaxy and uh, it's, a, it's a flat disc shaped thing so when we look at it from the inside it seems to stretch from one side of the sky to the other and at the moment it's stretching nicely all the way across the sky from north to south at the start of the evening during February as the hours go on during the night and the earth turns the Milky Way swings around so that's more or less east-west by the time you get to dawn so it's up there nice and high beautiful to look at if you've got a wide field telescope or a pair of binoculars get them out and take a look along the length of the Milky Way there are hundreds and hundreds of things to see star clusters and nebulae and all sorts of things it's, it's really quite specky and you don't need a hugely expensive telescope you don't need the biggest telescope in the world in fact for this sort of viewing you want a small one because you want to get a wide field view big telescopes Telescopes generally are used to get high magnification, and that's good for certain things. But with high magnification, what happens is your field of view narrows down. It gets really, really narrow, so you're not seeing much. You might be seeing what you're looking for, which might be a really faint, fuzzy galaxy that's so far away. Um, its light is so faint that you need a big telescope. But if you want to do big, grand, sweeping along the Milky Way style viewing, then you need just a pair of binoculars or a small telescope that gives you a nice wide field of view. So there you go, a bit of advice there. So now far down in the south at the moment, the good old Southern Cross, our favourite, is uh, still lying on its left-hand side. Southern Cross, by the way, looks more like a kite. When they say cross, they don't mean a cross in the sense of like a plus sign on a keyboard or, you know, the mathematical plus sign. It's more like a cross as a crucifix. In fact, the correct name for the Southern Cross is Crooks. C-R-U-X. At least that's the correct name that we use in English. So yeah, the Southern Cross is way down there in the south, lying on its left-hand side. As the night gets older, it rises higher and higher in the sky, so it becomes a bit easier to see, particularly if you've got some hills or trees or things in the way. Up above, almost overhead, got the beautiful, big, bright constellations of Orion and uh, Canis Major. They're shining big and brightly up there. We've spoken about Orion many times. Canis Major, or the Greater Dog, contains the brightest star in the night sky, and that's a Sirius which is actually a double star. Now, when we say brightest star, that's the apparent brightest. That's the one that looks brightest to us. That doesn't mean that it's the brightest star in the universe. It's just that it's a combination of how bright it intrinsically is and, and its distance from us. It's not very far to away, is stars. it? It isn't that far away, no. And it's nice and big and bright. There are stars out there that are huge compared to Sirius, but because they're, they're much further away, they don't seem to be quite as bright. 
But Sirius is a beautiful sight. It really is a lovely star to see. Now, so what's going on planet-wise? Well, on February the 1st, actually, if you take a look out to the west around 9pm, uh, at least this is for 9pm Southern Hemisphere style, you'll see an amazing sight. You're going to see the Moon and Mars and Venus all in a straight line together. Uh, low down on the horizon towards the west, but it's going to be really quite specky. Can't miss the Moon, of course. You won't be able to miss Venus because it's the biggest, brightest thing aside from the Moon. It's a very, very bright-looking star, although it's not a star of the planet. And in the middle of them will be a little red dot which is Mars so um, that'll be really really picky to see Venus and Mars are actually getting very low down on the horizon at the moment they're going to both disappear from view from the evening sky by the, about the end of the third week of February so if you've got some clear skies in the beginning of February make sure you grab the chance to go out and spot them if you're up a little bit later in the night about 11pm midnight that sort of thing have a look out to the east because the giant planet Jupiter will be rising okay Venus and Mars will have gone down by that stage but in the east Jupiter will be rising about 11pm uh, at the beginning of February it looks like a big big bright star but it is in fact of course a planet as well and if you're having trouble spotting which one's Jupiter take a look on February the 15th because the moon's going to be right next to it that's actually a good way to identify the planets if you're having trouble because the moon eventually makes its way in, uh, along the sky and then it usually ends up next to each of the planets in turn so February 15th you'll see the moon right next to Jupiter there's not much else happening in the evening sky this February but if you're an early riser take a look out to the east few hours before dawn and you'll be able to see Saturn. Now Saturn looks like a fairly bright, slightly yellowish coloured star. If you have a telescope or you can borrow one or get hold of one somehow or other take a look at Saturn because it's really quite specky. This is the thing that everyone looks through a telescope and goes, ah, like that. My goodness, it really is out there floating in space because you can see the rings and everything depending on the size of the telescope you might see one or two of the moons as well. And just like Jupiter, if you're having trouble figuring out which of those bright dots in the sky is Saturn well, take a look on February the 21st as the moon will be right next to Saturn, okay? And of course, Saturn posed a real problem for Galileo when he first saw it. He didn't realise he was looking at a planet with rings and he couldn't quite work out what these air-like projections on either side of this planet were and that was a real puzzle for him back in the 1600s. That's right, because his telescope was very small and the optics weren't great compared to uh, our day, of course, so he wasn't getting the best view. Uh, all he saw was that the, the planet wasn't round, it had these things sort of sticking out the side of it, so as telescopes got better, eventually astronomers saw that, hey, these were rings, this sort of flat and round thing encompassing or encircling Saturn. And eventually as telescopes got bigger and bigger and they got much better views, they could see that there actually was uh, like a big gap between the planet itself and the inner edge of the ring. So this was an entirely separate thing going around Saturn. And, um, and that's where Cassini is now. Cassini's going through those rings and, and also it's about to go through the bit between the planet and the rings for the first time because that's something they haven't done until now. They've been a bit scared, but with Cassini's mission, ending later this year. Now they're getting really adventurous with some of the angles and trajectories they're placing the spacecraft on. That's right, they're going for broke. They've got all the main things they want to get done, so now they can take a few risks and fly through some risky areas. Speaking of Cassini, of course, we mentioned that there's this big gap between the planet and the inner edge of the rings. Well, sort of two-thirds or half the way through the breadth of the rings, there is another gap, and that's called the Cassini division, named after the man who um, spotted it and identified it. You might recall, actually, the... Uh, now, was it Voyager 1 or 2 or both also went through the plane of Saturn's rings? They didn't go diving right through the middle of them, but they survived getting through there, and everyone held, had their breath held while that was happening. The Voyager spacecraft were really spectacular in what they've shown us about the outer solar systems because thanks to Voyager, we now know that all the gas giants have rings. They're not as spectacular as Saturn's, but Jupiter has dark rings, so too does Uranus and Neptune. Indeed, Aruni. And, you know, we've got an article coming up soon in Australian Sky and Telescope about the discovery of the rings of Uranus, which was, was that, 1978, I think it was. And um, Perth Observatory in Western Australia played a very major role in the observations that discovered those uh, rings going around Uranus. They weren't expecting rings to be there at all. They simply weren't. They were just interested in looking, seeing whether they might be able to see some new moons that might be there. But all these observations started coming in. They thought, goodness me, this looks, this is more like rings or at least parts of rings or arcs of rings and not perhaps not a complete ring going around the planet. But yeah, uh, as we now know, as you say, the voyages have shown us up close that all of those four major planets have rings going around them. And look, probably all planets at one point did if these rings were made of stuff that the same sort of material from which the planets form 
formed and leftover stuff got left in orbit, some of which might have coalesced into moons. Well, that's how the Earth got its moon, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So um, all these exoplanets they're finding out there circling other stars, they're bound to have rings going around them too. And in a couple of million years' time, Mars will have a ring again when Phobos starts to break apart as it gets closer and that's closer That's right, the tidal forces, as it gets a bit, yeah, it's going to break, break apart, but um, won't be around to see that one. No, I might be a bit old then too myself. Might as well make do with Saturn at the moment. That's Jonathan Nally, editor of Australian Sky and Telescope magazine. And that's the show for now. You can subscribe and download Space Time as a free twice-weekly podcast through iTunes, Stitcher, Bytes.com, Pocket Casts, SoundCloud, YouTube, Audio Boom, and from SpaceTimeWithStuartGary.com. The show is also broadcast coast-to-coast across the United States on Science360 Radio by the National Science Foundation in Washington, D.C. This is Space Time with Stuart Gary. For more, you can follow us on Facebook, Twitter and Tumblr. Just search for Space Time with Stuart Gary. Space Time is brought to you in collaboration with Australian Sky and Telescope magazine, your window on the universe.